Okay, so today, um, hopefully, um, not hopefully, so we're going to actually get to the main topic of this mini course, which you notice we haven't really done so far. Um, well, I guess in some sense, in some sense, a model category is one way to think about um, a homotopical category, although I didn't necessarily um, motivate it in that way. So. What I want to do in the remaining two lectures is sort of motivate it from a couple of different perspectives. And today, the way I want to motivate it is by just starting with some things that we've seen and, and then try to generalize them a little bit and see how this leads to a couple of the different approaches um, to homotopical categories. So um, something that we talked about on Tuesday and I think have, have come up in um, some of the other talks is that we have this idea of the nerve of a category. So we're going to start there. So recall the nerve of a category C is defined by, so this is going to be a simplicial set, and its n simplices are just going to be given by the functors from the category with just a string of n composable arrows into C. Okay, so we know that this is, this defines a functor from the category of small categories to the category of simplicial sets. And we talked last time about how um, Simplicial sets have a model structure, and it's really designed so that the model structure on simplicial sets is going to be equivalent to the model structure on topological spaces. So we said something is weakly equivalent here if it becomes a weak homotopy equivalence of topological spaces. Um, so we have some sense. I'm not really going to worry about There actually is a model structure on CAT. I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm just going to worry about the fact we have some notion of equivalence. Um, so. so last time we looked at um, weak equivalences of simplicial sets. Okay. And, but what do we mean by an equivalence of categories? And I referred to this yesterday, and I asked if people needed to know what that was, and everybody was shy, and then people came up afterwards and said, oh, what's, what's an equivalence of? So you need to not be shy. If you don't know what it is, you should, you should ask. So let me tell you what an equivalence of categories is. So, so if I have a functor, F, between categories C and D, so these are just categories. They're, I'm not talking about model categories or anything here, just a functor, ordinary functor of categories. This is an equivalence of categories. if um, two things hold. So the first is that if I pick um, any two objects of C, well, I can look at the HOM set between those objects and then send that over to D, and I want the HOM set to be isomorphic. So Okay, and this is um, what's known as being fully faithful, fully faithful functor. So that actually can be broken up into two things. So um, full would mean that this map is, is surjective, and faithful means that this map is injective. And since we want it to be an isomorphism, we stick it together and say it's fully faithful. Okay, and then the second, so this is really a statement about morphisms, but if we're going to have an equivalence, we need to say something about the objects as well. And so our second condition is that if I take any object of D, well, I'm not going to require that it actually be in the image of F, but it just has to be in the image of F up to isomorphism. So there needs to exist some object X in C such that Z is isomorphic to F of X. And this is what's called being, so it's not surjective, but it's what's called essentially surjective. Okay. 
So if, we, if you have a category, so something to think about here. If you have a category and you stick on you know, some other objects, but they're isomorphic to other objects that were already there, the inclusion of the original into it is, is going to be an equivalence. So we don't care about adding on more stuff that's isomorphic to things that we already have. OK. So what we'd like to do is investigate the nerve functor in light of what we mean by equivalences here and here, our equivalences preserved, and so forth. Yes? Is this clearly um, Well, exercise. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's clear. If you don't believe that it's an equivalence relation, then uh, yeah. So yes, yes. So if you if you have an equivalence of categories, then there is another functor going back. And again, it's not going to be an it's not an isomorphism of categories. I mean, just being essentially surjective, you there is something to say in terms of well, if it's not surjective, how do you define a functor going back? But it is true that if you have an equivalence of categories, then you're going to have a functor going back in the other direction. That's also an equivalence of categories. Okay. okay. Um, so here's for our starting point today, and that's that if I have a functor that's an equivalence of categories, Then, if I apply the nerve functor, I'm going to get weakly equivalent, a weak equivalence of simplicial sets. Okay, so that's. That's a nice property to have. Let's look at an example, just a very the simplest possible example we could, we could think of. And that's, let's just take C to be the category with one object X and just an isomorphism, nothing else. And then let's look at D, which has two objects, um, say Y and Z, and they are isomorphic. So there's just a single isomorphism between them. And I'm going to define a functor f from c to d that just takes x and sends it to y. And I, there's not much else to say. Uh, the identity map on x goes to the identity map on y. Um, and we can check that this is an equivalence of categories. Okay, so we can see that, checking the first condition, so hom in C from x to x is just a singleton, it's just the identity, but that's also hom in D from, well, f of x to f of x, well, this is just y. And since this is just an isomorphism, if I go and come back, it's just the identity, so there's, there's nothing. And here we have this functor is not surjective, so Z is not in the image of this functor F, but Z is isomorphic to Y, which is, which is in the image. So we're, we're fine. Okay, so that is, we know that that's an equivalence of categories, but if we pass to the nerve, well, Really, we're passing to the geometric realization of the nerve, to the classifying space. And these are both giving us contractible spaces. And so the induced map between them is just a map between two contractible spaces. That's going to be certainly going to be a weak equivalent. So. And I'll just sort of abuse notation, say they're both contractible as whereby contractible, I mean, after geometric realization, the contractible spaces. 
OK. So again, that's a nice property. And we might ask, well, what about the converse? If we have a, a functor between categories, we take the nerve and we get a weak homotopy equivalence, um, or weak equivalence of simplicial sets. Um, was the functor that we had an equivalence of categories? And the answer to that is no. So the converse doesn't hold. Okay, so what goes wrong? Well, let's introduce another example. Let's look at the category E, which <clears throat> let's say has two objects. A and B, and we just have a single morphism going from A to B. Okay? Now, I could look at, I could define the functor G from C to E, where X gets sent to A, and we're still fine on the first condition. This is fully faithful because, I mean, I, I still just have an identity from A to itself and nothing else. But it's no longer essentially surjective. Because if I look at B, B is not, not isomorphic to A. We don't have an isomorphism here. It's connected by an arrow, but it's not isomorphic. So it doesn't satisfy um, that second condition. OK. But the nerve of this, I mean, if you take the nerve of this, Geometrically realized, we just get an interval. We still get a contractible space. Um, so, so the nerve of G is uh, a weak equivalence of simplicial sets. So this, this gives us um, some indication that something isn't optimal here. Um, that somehow we're losing information when we take the nerve functor. And what, what the problem is really is that when we take the nerve, well, once we have a simplicial set, we still have some notion of direction of, you know, we had arrows going in a certain direction. That information is retained when we go to the simplicial set. But we lose that information when we look at a weak equivalence of simplicial sets because we're defining it in terms of what happens after geometric realization. Once we pass all the way to a space, every arrow in your category just turns into to some, some interval, some like one cell in your space. We don't remember anything anymore. What direction it went? Did it have an inverse? We will really lose all that information. And so that's really the information that we're losing. OK, everybody has all the information over here. I can erase it. Okay. So. Okay. So the issue is so to know to know categories are equivalent we need to know whether morphisms are isomorphisms. But passing to the nerve and the geometric realization loses this information. So this might lead us to the question of, 
can we remedy this in some way? Can we refine something in this construction so that we have an if and only if statement? Okay. So can we rethink the nerve construction um, and or our notion of equivalence um, to um, sort of remedy this issue. So to get um, an if and only if statement. Okay, and we're going to do this from two different approaches. Um, so I suggested even in the statement of this question that there might be a couple ways to do it. One by doing a different construction, another maybe by maybe having a different definition of equivalence that might pick up, pick up more refined information. So we're going to look at both of those. Okay, so the first is we're going to um, rethink what we mean by weak equivalences of simplicial sets. And the second is we're going to rethink the nerve construction. And then we can compare maybe the different things that we get and, and see you know, what we think. Yes? When you say the nerve construction, you're including the geometric field as part of the process? Um, not, not, I mean, I guess it doesn't, it, in what I'm going to do, it's not going to matter. Okay. Um, I mean, the idea is that in number one, we're going to want something where we're not taking geometric realization because that's part of the problem. Here, we're going to come up with a fancier nerve construction, so we're still going to do something like geometric realization, but we're going to have picked up more information. So. Okay, so I'm going to start with approach number one by what might sound a little bit like an unrelated question, but it's going to actually end up being useful. So, so we're looking at, we're talking about nerves of categories, but not every simplicial set is the nerve of a category. I mean, here we're, we're looking at, well, when are two nerves of, of categories equivalent? They might be coming from an equivalence of categories, but not, but I mean, there's lots and lots of simplicial sets out there that may or may not be the nerves of categories. So really to look at this, we should say, which simplicial sets, can we identify which simplicial sets arise as nerves of categories? What properties do they have? So, So if we can identify those, that's going to help a lot. Okay. Well, so we get the nerve of a category by saying, all right, well, if I have um, arrows, they turn into one simplices. Well, arrows in your category have to have composition. So if I have you know, an arrow like this and an arrow like that, then I need to be able to fill them in with a composite. Well, that, that information is going to need to be in the simplicial set. If I have a configuration of one simplices like this, in general, nothing in the definition of simplicial set says I need to be able to fill these in. But if I can't fill them in, it's not going to be the nerve of a category. So let's kind of pick that apart. So, so our answer is, so essentially, so 
So whenever we have what we could call composable, meaning of that configuration I just drew, one simplices, they need to have a unique composite. And then, well, remember in the nerve of a category, if I have, you know, a one simplex composed with another one simplex, then I have to fill that in with a two simplex. I can't just get the boundary, it has to be filled in because that's, that's where you get the two simplices in a nerve. And then, so this all needs to be Okay, so in the most basic case, so suppose suggestively label them F and G, make them sound like functions, I have a configuration of one simplices like this, then I'd better be able to fill it in uniquely. There better be only one arrow that fits in here that I can call then G compose with F and then I should be able to fill it in. But we have to do even better than that because the nerve of a category is going to have three simplices and four simplices, possibly all kinds of more interesting things. So if I have, say, an F and a G and an H, so a string of three composable arrows, I need to be able to do, get a couple of colors here. Um, so if I already assume this works, then I should be able to fill in this guy with some G composed with F, and I should be able to fill in here with an H composed with G, and then these get filled in by a two simplex. But then once I've done that, well, then I have an issue of, well, I could compose F with H composed with G, or I could compose this G composed with F and then compose it with H. Now, this condition here says I can fill the back side here, or I can fill this bottom side down here. But if it's coming from a category, they have to coincide. Composition in a category is associative. So if I fill this in here, then I have to be able to just have a single, okay. And we have to keep doing this forever. So for arbitrarily high simplices, we need to be able to fill things in. So the question is, is how, how can I describe this in a concise way? Well, we can describe it using these horns of simplices that uh, we talked about um, each of the last couple days, so we can call this a horn filling condition. So let's go back to just the case of, of just composition. So if I have some kind of configuration that looks like this, this is V21. I've taken the boundary of a two simplex, omitted the face opposite the, this would be 0, 1, 2, opposite the 1 vertex. I can think of including this in to a filled in two simplex. And the point is, okay, whenever I have this kind of configuration, I have some simplicial set here. Every time I have something that looks like this, I need to be able to extend it to something that looks like this. So that means I need to have a lift. Okay? And it needs to be unique because composition in a category is unique. Okay, now maybe the dimension up isn't quite as obvious why it's going to look like a horn. Um, 
I mean, certainly this is not a horn of a three simplex. It's, it's something a little more sparse. But we could say, all right, let's, let's unpack the stages here. So first, um, get there. so first I filled in this guy and this guy and filled them in, but that's still not a horn. But I can get a horn in two different ways from this by either filling in the back or the bottom here. So I can either just repeat this picture twice and then I'll fill it in different ways. This gets a little hard to see. Okay. But here, I mean, in this picture, I'm kind of doing it all together. Here I'm saying, okay, in this picture, let me put in this as sort of the back face. So I don't have the bottom face, and then, of course, it's not filled in as a three simplex. Over here, I have a different choice. I could say, let's put in that same arrow, but fill in the bottom. So one of these corresponds to HG composed with F, one corresponds to H composed with GF. So, okay, so which one is which? So this would be V31. So this is the one vertex, the bottom face is the one opposite that. And then this would be V32. So this is the vertex two, and let me go ahead and draw these in so you can see, zero, one, two, three. So then the face opposite two, that's this back triangle, that's the one that's empty. Okay, so in order to fill in this whole three simplex, we need to have two things. We need to either be able to fill in this horn uniquely and this horn uniquely. Well, and if you're doing it uniquely, you can check that these actually, then they're going to be, then this blue arrow here is really going to be the same arrow for both because if you don't believe that, that the, you can check that. So, so to fill in the three simplex we need, so basically if we have V, 3, 1 included into uh, delta 3. We need to be able to lift this uniquely, but we'd also need, if we have the other one, so V3, 2 included into delta 3, we need to have a unique lift there. And so on for higher, um, for higher dimensional simplices which are capturing higher dimensional, or so higher compositions, more iterations of compositions. Well, you, but that's what it is that because the way you fill, so I have, let's say I've filled in this back one, there's a unique way to fill the whole thing into a three simplex, but if I have this set up instead, there's a unique way, you can check that I mean, the unique way to fill this in and the unique way to fill that in have to be the same thing. Okay. Exercise if you, don't, if you don't believe that. Try to work out why that would have to be. Okay. Okay, so now this is going to give us our characterization. So a simplicial set K is the nerve of a category if and only if a unique lift exists in any diagram of the form VNK into being included into delta N. So, okay, so every time I have a shape VNK in K, sorry, that's, 
Anyway, this is a capital K, that's a little K. Um, every time a unique lift exists there, now here we have to be careful, this is for every n at least one. We, we know we don't, we don't, there's nothing here if n is equal to zero, but we don't have all the horns here. We only have the horns that are strictly, where k is strictly between zero and n. So notice, you know, here we're looking at composition. We're only looking, we only are looking here at V21. We're not looking at V20, V22. Come back to that in a minute. And so when you have this condition, when you don't include the extreme possibilities for K, these are what are called inner horns. Okay, there are questions so far here. Okay. So, how far is this from being like fiber? Um, I'll, I'll get to that. So, we're not, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, so now let's say, well, we left out, we had these other horns, but those other horns what are called the outer horns, um, they, weren't, they had nothing to do with encoding the structure of a category. Well, so what are they encoding? Okay, well, let's look at the case of n equals two and see what is happening there. Okay, so if I, so here is V20, and here is V, Two. Okay. So these configurations of arrows don't have any, they're not dealing with composition anymore. These are not composable arrows. So what would it mean? We talked a little bit yesterday about con complexes. Um, we talked about certain simplicial sets having this horn filling condition with respect to these. So what does it mean if we can also lift with respect to these horns? Well, if I could, let me label these again, um, let's say F and G. Well, what does it mean if I could, and let's again assume we're talking uniquely here. What does it mean if I can fill this arrow in uniquely? Well. That should mean that this looks like, okay, I want to start here and end here. That means I'm going to go backwards along F and forwards along G. So this should be something that's like G composed with F inverse. If I'm, if I'm filling that in. Similarly over here, um, call this G again, I'll call this one H. So if I can fill this guy in, well that means I'm going along G and backwards along H. So this should be H inverse composed with G. Well now we can see why this wasn't coming up when we're just looking at nerves of categories because, well, we're just assuming they're categories. Why should F have an inverse? Why should H have an inverse? But if you can fill these horns in uniquely, that means you do have inverses. So this is saying that, so filling these horns in tells you you have inverses. I mean, so you have a left inverse and a right inverse. If they're both holding, then you're getting inverses. Okay, so re just recall some terminology here. Um, a category is a groupoid. if all the morphisms are invertible. 
They're all isomorphisms. Okay. Okay, so now we have an analog of that proposition, and this says a simplicial set K is the nerve of a groupoid. Um, if and only if a unique lift exists in a diagram like this, but where we have all the horns. Okay, so to be a category, you only have to have this unique lifting property with respect to the inner horns. To be a groupoid, you also have to have the lifting property with respect to these horns. And you, I mean, you need all the higher, the higher level outer horns as well, but I think just looking at these, you see what information that's giving you. Okay, but now, this should remind us of something we saw yesterday. We were looking at exactly, well, not exactly exactly, but almost exactly this condition yesterday um, when we were looking at fibrant objects in the model structure on simplicial sets. Um, so let's recall what that was. So a simplicial set is a con complex, which was again our name for the fibrant objects in the model structure, if a lift, but not necessarily a unique lift. We did not require uniqueness yesterday. Um, and yesterday we were talking about fibrant objects, and so we actually had, I mean, this is the map telling you it's a fibration, but, I mean, really you don't need, I mean, with things just going to a point, you don't really need this. You can just say you have a lift here. Okay, so this should at this point give us some kind of intuition about what a con complex is. Now, we just saw that if this lift is unique, that means we have the nerve of a groupoid. But here it's not unique. Well, what does it mean to not have a unique lift? That means, well, I mean, let's just look here. If I maybe had different ways to fill this in, that means I, have, I don't have unique composition. But, okay, this isn't a standalone condition. You have other fillings. You can, you know, if you had one way to fill it in and you had another way to fill it in, but you could then fill those in by one of your other horn filling conditions, you know, you can start. So what this means is that if you have a non-unique lift, you have something that looks like a groupoid but only up to homotopy you have some different possibilities for composition, but they're going to have simplices between them and, and so on. So, so the upshot is a con complex may not actually be the nerve of a groupoid, but it looks like one up to homotopy. Okay. 
Okay, now we can bring back in how these were playing a role in the model category. These were the fibrant objects. And remember that every object in a model category has a fibrant replacement, meaning you can find a fibrant object that's weakly equivalent to it. So in our model structure on simplicial sets, we can take any simplicial set, find a weakly equivalent con complex. That means I'm thinking of every simplicial set as being equivalent to something that's sort of like a nerve of a groupoid. Okay. So well, let me write more here. So Okay, so this means every simplicial set um, can be viewed, I guess you could say, as, well, I don't know if I want to say that. Every, let me say it differently. Um, every simplicial set is weakly equivalent to an up to homotopy groupoid. <laughs> what that means is that our notion of weakly equivalence, of weak equivalence, is completely useless if you want to tell the difference between the nerve of a category and a nerve of a groupoid, which is what we were seeing when we saw that nerves didn't, didn't necessarily detect whether the functor that they came from was an equivalence of categories. Because equivalence of categories, it was really important. Were those arrows isomorphisms or not? Once we pass to nerve, take simplicial set, with this notion of weak equivalence, we can't, we can't tell the difference anymore. We don't, we don't care. So somehow this is the wrong structure to look, look at if what you're interested in is the difference between a category and a groupoid, or the difference between invertible arrows, non-invertible arrows. Okay, so what we would, could ask then is could we have an up to homotopy category version? Because we saw we have, yeah, we had this characterization of the nerve of a groupoid and that's what's being generalized to get a con complex. But we have this characterization of what, what the nerve of a category looks like. Why can't we have an up to homotopy version of that? Okay. So the following um, definition goes back to Boardman invoked. They gave it a different name. They called it an inner con complex, um, which actually makes sense, but uh, given our notation or terminology so far. Um, so a simplicial set, K, we're going to call it a quasi category. It's the more common usage now. Um, if a, so we're going to just take the analog of a con complex, but look at just having the inner horns filled in. So if a not necessarily unique lift exists in, so our VNK and delta N mapping into K, I want to have a lift, but now only for the inner horns, not the outer horns. Okay. 
Okay, so how does that, uh, how does that help with our notion of vibrant replacement, things being weakly equivalent? We would like something where maybe not everything is weakly equivalent to a con complex, but something where things were just weakly equivalent to a quasi category. Okay, so a theorem um, that was proved independently by both uh, Joyal and Lurie is that there is a model structure on the category of simplicial sets. such that the fibrant objects are the quasi-categories. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you um, what the weak equivalences are, just because it's not but just you should be thinking that the weak equivalences look something, have more of the flavor of an equivalence of categories and less of a flavor of equivalences of topological spaces. Okay? Saying rigorously what they are is just more complicated. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, the co-fibrations, again, are just going to be just the inclusions, just like our other model structure. Um, but the key feature here is really this is as much like the model structure we talked about yesterday as possible, but now your fiber and objects are quasi-categories instead of con complexes. So that means you're thinking of every simplicial set as being equivalent to some nerve, some up to homotopy nerve of a category, not, not, to, the, not to an up, and, up to homotopy groupoid necessarily. So the, the weak equivalences here are more refined, I guess. They're picking up more information than, than in the other model structure. Okay. In particular, the, the weak equivalences here are going to detect the difference between a nerve of a category and the nerve of a groupoid. It's going to be able to distinguish between these categories um, we talked about at the beginning. So basically just that um, basically just that this is not not unique in that you have a way to fill in you have some chain of composable arrows you can always fill it in but it's not unique and in order to really really be the nerve of a category the nerve of a group weight it has to be unique because composition is unique but um, but if it's not if it's not unique, then you have some notion of composition, but you could have multiple ways to compose, you know, a composable string of arrows. Okay. Right. okay. Okay, so weak equivalences in this category distinguish between nerves of categories and nerves of groupoids. One way to see that is just certainly if you are the nerve of a category, then you're certainly a quasi-category. I mean, it's a stronger condition. You have a unique lift and not just some lift. Um, and so you don't, if you were to do a fibrant replacement here, well, it's already fibrant. You didn't have to do anything. In the other model structure on simplicial sets, you had to do something because it was going to end up looking like a con complex. So, but you, do, you don't have to make it look like some kind of groupoid to make it, to make it um, vibrant. So, uh, yeah? Um, you mentioned uh, that in a model category, the vibrations and weak equivalence is determined. Yeah. Right, so this is not, I haven't told you everything. Um, I think, I, I want to say, I mean, so, 
Right, what I've written down, I'm not sure. I, act, I, think, I think Duggar and Spivak actually prove that there's a unique model structure where this is true. Um, well, maybe it's like the fiber and objects are quasi-categories and the co-fibration, and the co-fibrations are the monomorphisms. I don't remember the way they, so yeah, this should not be taken as a rigorous statement, um, but I don't, I don't want to take the time to go in and say, you know, because not, I want you to just see the uh, analogous features to the model structure we talked about yesterday rather than go in and tell you all the, um, the, the um, maybe what's, what's better to say here is that the vibrations are these, um, if you look at the vibrations in the other model structure, but just take only the inner horns, so like the inner con vibrations, those are going to be the vibrations here. Um, but yeah, I don't want to go into rigorously telling you what all the features of this model structure are. Okay. Okay. So going back to the notation from our example at the beginning, if we looked at the nerve of C, this was just our uh, category with one object and an identity, and the nerve of E, E was our category with, so this was C, this was E. These are no longer equivalent in this model structure. Okay. okay. So there's, so this is one way of fixing our problem with the nerve construction losing information is you just change what you mean by the nerve of two categories being equivalent. And now you can, you can tell them apart. Okay, so now I want to turn to the other approach. And this was where we changed the construction. So now we're going to we're going to go back and go back to our notion of weak equivalence, the simplicial sets that we had before. Um, so just we're not not thinking about any of the quasi category stuff now, and say, well, what was the problem? You know, I had this nerve construction; it just sort of lumped everything together: the isomorphisms, the non-isomorphisms, everything gets stuck together. And then when I pass to the, the nerve and the classifying space, I can't, it's all just mushed together. I can't tell what anything was anymore. So Charles Rask had this idea to say, well, let's separate it out. Let's just take the isomorphisms and then look, let's look at the nerve there and then let's look at everything and take the nerve there and then see, see what we get, okay? So this is what um, calls the classifying diagram. So, so let C be a small category. So it's um, classifying diagram. And the name comes from, it's not going to be a classifying space. Um, it's just, it's going to be a diagram of spaces. In particular, it's going to be a bisimplicial set or um, a simplicial space. So I'm going to call this NC. Um, I know this is sometimes used for nerve, but it's not what I've been using for nerve. So within this talk, it should be consistent. Um, so this is defined by, so this is going to be a, bi, uh, let's see, oops. Stick in what it is. So it's the bisimplicial set. Defined by, so I, its n simplices should form a simplicial set, and I want that simplicial set to be nerve iso c to the n. Okay, so let me unpack what this means. So, so c to the n is the category with objects. So this notation really means functors from n into c. So that just means strings of 
n composable arrows in C. And then your morphisms, so if I have two of these guys, then a morphism, get some, oh, no, let me not use the color chalk yet. Um, the, a morphism will just be an n plus one tuple of arrows such that all, the whole diagram commutes. Now, what do I mean here by ISO? So if I want ISO C to the n, then I want these morphisms to be isomorphisms. That's just going to mean that these will all be isomorphisms. So those each form, so that forms a category for each n, take its nerve, that's a simplicial set. Okay, so why is this helpful? Well, let's look in what's happening in low dimensions. Okay, so if I look at NC0, well, so this is the nerve ISO C to the zero. Well, zero is just a point, so this is just C. So this is just the nerve of, I mean, the fancy language for it is the maximal subgroupoid of C. It just means take the category with all the isomorphisms in C, throw all the non-isomorphisms out. Take the nerve of that. So in particular, NC0 is only getting information about isomorphisms. That's it. Everything else has been thrown out. Okay, but then what about NC1? So this is the nerve of ISO C upper 1. So this is the category that has objects, any arrows. Now, the morphisms between them are going to need to be isomorphisms, but these are no longer isomorphisms. So this is now picking up information about your non-isomorphisms. So you can see where you've separated this out. Level zero, only getting information about isomorphisms. Level one, picking up now information about everything else. And then, well, you, you can keep going. Um, so just to give you an idea, so in general, if I have, so NCN, well, that should be a simplicial set. What are its m simplices? Well, NCN is looking at chains of n composable arrows. And if I want the m simplices, well, so these are the objects in C to the n, but now I'm looking at chains of m composable arrows of those. So that means I'm going to have length m chains of you know, isomorphisms going this way. So it's, it's just the set of all configurations of that shape in C. Okay. okay, now this has some, some nice properties. So one thing to notice, let's just look at, you know, if I'm looking at NC2, let's look at maybe the one simplices of NC2. They look something like this. Well, this looks an awful lot like the one simplices of NC1 glued together along an object of, I mean, remember these are isomorphisms. So the whole thing looks like an object of NC21. These two guys look like objects of NC11. And then the middle looks like something in NC01. Okay. And that is going to hold more generally. That's going to be our first fact. 
and that is that if I look at NCN, this is going to look like an iterated pullback of copies of NC1 along NC0. Where there's n copies of NC1. Okay, the second property is something I've, I have these labeled A and B, not to can. A, B, and C, not to be confused with approaches one and two. Um, so the second property is something I already started to talk about, but I want to say it a little bit more rigorously, is I mean, we can see that certainly we have no information here about um, any non-isomorphisms of C. We certainly see that that information is getting picked up here. I claim that the difference between NC0 and NC1 is exactly data about the non-invertible morphisms and nothing else. So how can, I, how can I say that more rigorously? Well, one way that I can show this is say, well, what if I, what if I compared NC to, say, N of ISO C? So just take, take that maximal subgroup void of C and just apply the classifying diagram construction to that. Well, if I look at this guy, and Right now, I really just want to look at NC1 and NC0, which by this property is enough. If you know about NC1 and NC0, you, you can construct everything else. But if I look at N of ISO C and N, well, in levels 1 and 0, well, I have face maps and degeneracy maps. But so the first piece of part B is that this simplicial space or bisimplicial set is essentially constant. This is weakly equivalent to this. So these face and degeneracy maps are weak equivalences. They're not isomorphisms, <laughs> but they're weak equivalences. Sorry, so you defined what ISO C to the N is over here? Yeah. Is ISO C just the collection of all the Right. So right, ISO C is just the is I mean in this picture, so C to the 0 would just be objects of C together with, you know, isomorphisms between them. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's ISO C to the zero, which is this guy. It's just okay. ISO of C. Okay. Yeah. OK, so this is saying if everything's an isomorphism, I get a boring bisimplicial set. It's, it's just essentially the same thing at every level. I get no new information. But what I'm saying here is actually something even more. So if I compare this to NC0, now I have an in inclusion, but this, I mean, these guys are actually equal. Because in NC0, I threw out everything that wasn't an isomorphism. So these are exactly the same. But here, this is an inclusion. Because if C has non-invertible morphisms, I have more stuff here. But what this diagram says, um, so these are the degeneracy maps S0, if I take S0 of NC0, so if I go from here to here, that is going to be weakly equivalent to if, well, I think over here, go up by S0 and over by I. So this is I of S0 of, well, NC0, well, which I'm really thinking of it as N ISO C0. But they're equal. So that's a way of saying 
the isomorphism information in here is equivalent to what is happening at level zero. Okay. okay. Then one more property, and that is just observe that if I take NC, well, let the first variable vary, but just take the zero simplices at each level, that this is exactly the nerve of C. So I have, you know, the zero simplices in NC, the zero simplices of the nerve of I sub C, well, that's just the objects of C. Um, the zero simplices here, well, those are just the objects of C to the one, that's just the morphisms of C, and so on. Okay, so this is something you can check now. This is now, if you look at the classifying diagram of two different categories, this is going to be able to tell the difference between C and E now. Because if it's an isomorphism, if everything, it's a, if everything's an isomorphism, if you have a groupoid, you're just going to get something essentially constant. But if you have something interesting, uh, non-invertible morphisms, it's going to get picked up here, it's going to be detected, and you're going to see something different here than what you see here. So this is another way to, have the, to fix this problem of, um, you know, not being able to distinguish between the two. But when we were looking at the quasi-category approach, we saw that we weren't just looking at the nerves of categories, we were generalizing homotopically. We were generalizing nerves of groupoids to con complexes. We were generalizing nerves of categories to quasi-categories. We can generalize this homotopically also. Okay. So definition is that, so a bisimplicial set W is a complete Siegel space <laughs> if, so three conditions, one is here for technical reasons, I'm just saying it to be precise, but um, I need it to be injective fibrant. So we talked about these two different model structures on bisimplicial sets yesterday, the injective and the projective. I want it to be fibrant in the injective model structure. Um, it's just going to make some things be homotopy invariant that wouldn't be otherwise. That's, there's a lot under the hood there that I'm not, but I, I want to be correct here. I, now I want an analog of A here, but I want it to be homotopical, so I want this not to be an isomorphism, but just a weak equivalence of simplicial sets. So if I look at the n simplices, the, so this is a simplicial set in degree n, I want that to be weakly equivalent if I take an iterated pullback of w1s along w zeros. And then I want, so something um, I don't have time to say rigorously, but hopefully I can say more about it tomorrow. W0 is going to be equivalent to something called the space of homotopy equivalences. So this is some sub-simplicial set of W1. So I'm thinking somehow W0 is like objects, W1 is like morphisms. Some of those morphisms are something like homotopy equivalences. Whatever they are, that better be weakly equivalent to W0. So this is the analog of condition A. This is the analog of condition B. So the difference, again, between W1 and W0 is going to be something that are non-equivalences. Sorry? Yes, so a classifying diagram of a category is going to be a complete Siegel space. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. 
Okay, so um, last two minutes. So let me say, well, what about, what about property C? What's the analog there? Um, so this, I think I need to give credit to, I think this is basically due to Joyal and Tierney. Um, although it kind of, well, anyway. So given a complete Siegel space W, the simplicial set W star zero. Um, so just take the zero simplices of each W zero, W one, and so forth. This is a quasi category. So this is kind of like our analog of C. We take this homotopical version of the classifying diagram. We take a homotopical version of the nerve of the category, we still get this relationship holding. Except, again, it's not an equals anymore. It's a, um, well, I guess it is, it's equal to a quasi category. Okay. Okay. Um, well, so this is cool because then this brings the two of them together. That we didn't really do things that, in some sense, that were really essentially very different. And we can actually make that more rigorous. So I mentioned the model structure for quasi-categories. Let me just quickly say a little bit about a model structure here. And again, hopefully I can say a little bit more tomorrow. Um, so this is a theorem due to Charles Rask. Um, there is a model structure on by simplicial sets in which the fibrant objects are the complete Siegel spaces. And even, I mean, so to strengthen this a lot more, so this is due to Joyal and Tierney, is that um, the model structures for quasi categories and complete Siegel spaces are quo and equivalent. So that tells us that the homotopy theory of quasi-categories and the homotopy theory of complete Siegel spaces are the same. So they're two different homotopical models for essentially the same kinds of things. Okay, okay so I'll stop there. <laughs>